I want to read four different scriptures before we dive into the word this morning. And these scriptures describe Jesus' journey with the Holy Spirit. It's going to be on the screen here. Luke 1, 15, it says this, For he, talking about Jesus, will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. Luke 3, 21. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. Luke 4, 4. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Luke 4, 14. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out through all the surrounding region. Let's dive into this morning. You may have a seat. Let me start today by introducing myself. My name is Adam. I'm the pastor here, and what a privilege it is. If you're new today, to have you here and invite you uh, forward just to shake my hand after service. Would love uh, to meet you. And uh, it would be a really great privilege of mine to do so. We've, uh, we've been in a series we've entitled uh, Jesus Stories. And we're looking at the different miracles of Jesus throughout the New Testament. And this is Pentecost Sunday, as we have said already. And we're celebrating the... Uh, the descending of, Jesus, of the Holy Spirit in that upper room. And how many know that we wouldn't be here today as a church if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit coming? Jesus said, I'm going to send you a gift, and that's the Holy Spirit coming. And he sent us a gift, and the Holy Spirit is here today. I hope that you can sense the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Anyone here can sense the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit? He's here in a very tangible way. I can feel him this morning. There's nothing like having, I've told people, man, if we do have the Holy Spirit, we've got everything we need at Journey. We've got everything we need if we have the Holy Spirit. Jesus, we said this, Jesus did only what the Father asked him to do. But he also couldn't do what he did without the Holy Spirit's power in his life. We've read this passage uh, in this series before, but it really wraps this message together so well. Uh, Luke 4, 18, I want to read this again. Would you read this with me out loud? For the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. Yeah. I've entitled my message this morning this. The journey towards intimacy with the Holy Spirit. The journey towards intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're here this morning. That you said where two or three are gathered, there you are in their midst. God, I can sense the tangible, manifest presence of your spirit. I pray that right now, God, that you would come and you would breathe upon this word today. Lord, without you, Lord Jesus, we recognize and know that, God, we are nothing apart from you. Lord, Holy Spirit, we have to have you. As we always see here at Journey, God, we, we, Holy Spirit, we don't make room for you, but God, Holy Spirit, we give you the entire room. Would you move and would you work? Would you breathe upon this word, God? Would you take your logos word and would you make it rhema in our hearts and our lives, Jesus? 
We're here for one thing, and that is you. Lord, you've, you've brought us in this journey with you. And Lord, it's a journey towards friendship. It's a journey towards intimacy with you. Lord, I pray as we take this journey today, God, that we would apply it to our lives. And Lord, there would be today, we would all uh, walk in a deeper friendship, a deeper intimacy with you, Holy Spirit. You're a person, not an it. You're a person, not a manifestation. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. Holy Spirit, we love you with all that we have and all that we are. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. A foundational belief in Christianity and in most every Christian church is the belief in the Trinity, that God is three in persons. We have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now think about this. You and I were made up of three parts. We're made up of spirit, soul, and body. I'm three parts, but yet I am one, Adam, right? God is three parts. The Holy Spirit is God. Jesus, the Son of God, is God. And the Father, God, is God. But he's also one. Now, the Holy Spirit's role in the Trinity is he is the power of the three. I love to use this example. I used it last week in Growth Tracks. I love to use this example. Um, if I told someone right now, is that Steve back there? Steve, would you, uh, would you mind flipping the light switch back there? We didn't plan this. So the lights come on, right? So I gave Steve the command to turn the lights on. But did Steve turn the lights on? He flipped the switch, but what turned the lights on? The electricity turned the lights on. You can turn it off now, Steve. Thank you. Think about this. So I gave the command, God the Father. Steve flipped the light switch, God the Son. And the electricity, the Holy Spirit, turned the lights on. The Holy Spirit is power, but he's also a person. He's also a person. I grew up in... Uh, uh, non-animational, Pentecostal, charismatic, crazy church. And growing up as a uh, young person, I related the Holy Spirit to a feeling, to a goosebump. <laughs> yeah, I related him to the gift of tongues, the Holy Spirit to me when I was five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, early on. He was tongues, he was healing, he was when someone fell out the spirit, the Holy Spirit was uh, the heat that someone might feel, if the Holy Spirit's leading them to go do something, like that was to me what the Holy Spirit was in my early life. And many of us, in, even in church now, we can think of the Holy Spirit being just that way, and that's, that's it. But I had it. An experience with the Holy Spirit when I was 16 years old where everything changed. Some of you heard this story before. It wasn't a message. It was in the middle of worship where I just felt the overwhelming presence of God that just came over me in one moment. And from that point forward, everything in my life changed. I just began to get down on my knees and I began to weep and to cry because I re literally felt the Holy Spirit all over me and I surrendered my life to him. And in that moment... As a 16, 17 year old, I said, Lord, I want to create atmospheres where people can experience the power and the presence of God just like I did today. Because at that point, he was only knowledge to me. He was only a gift. He was only tongues. At that point, he was only healing. And in that moment, I discovered an intimacy and a friendship with the Holy Spirit that I began to really give my life to. So then from that point forward, I, I began to pick up the guitar and I began to learn it. 
I said, Lord, help me to walk in and in, 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 in give people this type of experience with you. So I picked up the guitar. I, I began to learn it. And I was in uh, full-time uh, ministry in worship, being a worship pastor for 17 years prior to this. But the only reason why I ever picked up a guitar was not my love for music, but it was an avenue to get into his presence. It was a place for me to get alone with the Lord and I would discover this intimate friendship with the Holy Spirit. I'm not suggesting to you, you gotta pick up the guitar and and learn that to, to be intimate with the Lord. I'm not suggesting that by no means at all. That was for me though my avenue to get with the Holy Spirit. And I would pick up my guitar and I would play it for literally hours at a time just because I was literally addicted to being with the Holy Spirit. That's where I was at as a 17, 18, 19 year old. I'm where I am today because that secret place and that friendship with the Holy Spirit that I developed as a young teenager. It started there. And I had this friendship I had this friendship with the Holy Spirit that was just so real. I remember, uh, this might sound a little different, but I would literally, uh, I'd be in the car with, with friends and there would be worship music on, everybody would be talking, and I would just want to cry and weep because I felt just so sensitive to the power and the presence of God that was in the car. Just because the worship, I was like, I just rather, I, instead of being with you guys, I'd rather just be with the Lord. I, that's just where I was at. Because I wanted that friendship. I, I, was, I wanted to be with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean that I've always uh, had this type of friendship and relation. There's been seasons in my life where, you know, I've allowed the busyness of life to get in. I've allowed circumstances and situations to take me away from this intimate friendship. But it's always like the Holy Spirit calls me back into this intimate friendship over and over and over again. It's this beautiful thing. But what's happened for us I believe a lot of times when it comes to our relationship with the Holy Spirit as believers and Christians, especially in a um, Pentecostal, charismatic, going after the full gifts of the Spirit like, like we are, is that we seek after the gifts rather than friendship with the gift giver. We treat the Holy Spirit more like a prostitute than we do a friend always trying to get something from him rather than just sitting and being with Jesus. Rather than just sitting and being with the Holy Spirit. You see, you were created for intimate friendship with the Holy Spirit. That's why you were created. For intimate friendship with the Holy Spirit. Would you say that? I'm created for intimate friendship with the Holy Spirit. Okay, that was a little weak out there. Let's try it again. I was created for intimate friendship with the Holy Spirit. One more time. I was created for intimate friendship with the Holy Spirit. That was much better. Much better. I want to give you five things this morning. Five things this morning on five different stages that Jesus went through in his relationship with the Holy Spirit. And the stages he went through are stages that we also go through as well. Now these stages are a journey, okay? A relationship with the Holy Spirit is a journey, and this journey should lead to a deeper and deeper intimacy and friendship with the person Remember, the Holy Spirit is a person with the person that is the Holy Spirit. If you're ready this morning, say, let's go. Let's go. All right. I love that. That was good. Number one, in stage one of our journey towards intimacy with the Holy Spirit, we are born of the Spirit. We are born of the Spirit. Jesus was born of the Spirit when he was conceived. And one of the reasons Jesus lived a supernatural life is because he had a supernatural birth. Look at this, Luke 1, 15. He, this is talking about Jesus, he will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. So Jesus has the Holy Spirit in the womb. We have the Holy Spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit at salvation. 
Salvation is when our relationship with the Holy Spirit begins. And actually, the Holy Spirit is the one who leads us to the cross, leads us to Jesus, but that relationship with the Holy Spirit begins at salvation. Now, now in, in, in John 3, uh, Nicodemus, a Pharisee, comes to Jesus. He says, I mean, Jesus, your miracles, incredible. Your teachings, incredible. You are certainly God. And Jesus replies to Nicodemus. He says this. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water. Now you might be thinking, okay, unless one is born of water, that has to do with water baptism. This, this unless one is born of water is talking about a physical the physical birth, okay? It's not talking about water baptism. You're not saved by being baptized. That is an outward confession of your faith, okay? So you're not saved just because you get baptized. It's an outward confession of your faith. So this is talking about a physical birth. So most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water or a physical birth and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is is spirit. Salvation, church, is not a get out of hell ticket. Salvation is not just in case there's a heaven and there's a hell that, hey, I'm just going to make sure I'm going to be okay, so I'm going to pray this prayer just in case heaven is real and hell is real. That's not what salvation is. And my friend, I'll, I'll, if I didn't love you, I wouldn't tell you this. Listen, the Bible says that narrow is the road that leads to life and wide is the road that leads to death. And if you have that type of mindset that just in case heaven's real and just in case hell is real, I'm going to pray this prayer. Listen, just praying a prayer is not going to get you to heaven. I would say if you have that type of heart and that mindset, you've got to be really careful. I'm concerned for you. Because that's not what salvation is all about. What does it say if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart? There's a faith, there's a belief that you will be saved. But salvation is an entrance into a kingdom, in the kingdom of God, which also comes along with that, us seeing and walking in the power of of the Holy Spirit. It's a supernatural entrance into this kingdom lifestyle. You see, Jesus, he did not model what it was like to be a God walking this planet. Jesus modeled, he modeled what it was like to be fully God. He was fully God, yet fully man. He modeled what it was like to walk in humility towards God, and be led by God and the Holy Spirit. So, no matter how much we humble ourselves, we're never going to be God, right? But if we humble ourselves, we can walk and reflect the image of Christ. Amen? Amen. So when you get born again by the Holy Spirit, this is where your relationship with the Holy Spirit begins. Number two this morning, stage two of our journey towards intimacy with the Holy Spirit, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was also filled with the Spirit. Luke 4.1. Then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit. So when was Jesus filled, when this is talking about, when was Jesus filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, in the previous chapter here, Jesus is baptized by John, and what, is, what happens? The Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus in bodily form, it says, like a dove descending and comes upon Jesus. Now, before we finish this this scripture here, I want to go to Ephesians 5, 18. It says this, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But what? 
be filled with the Spirit. So we need to be filled with the Spirit continually. Being filled with the Spirit is different than the indwelling of the Spirit. Let me give you uh, some definitions here so we really understand this. Indwelling of the Spirit refers to the Spirit taking residence within a believer at salvation. That is the indwelling of the Spirit. Now, filled with the Spirit is the direction or control that the indwelling of the Spirit possesses as this believer draws on his presence. Also very important here. The verb here, be filled, is present tense, which means to do it regularly or continually. It is also an imperative verb, which means that it is a command and not a suggestion. Last, this is a lot of information here, but it's important. Last is a passive voice, which means that while the command is given to us, we have to know that God is the one who fills us, right? God is the one who fills us. So we put ourselves out there to be filled, and we trust him that he's going to fill us. For me, if I miss my time with Jesus in the morning, I feel a shell to myself. Anybody else just feel that way? If you miss that personal encounter with God, you just feel like a shell of yourself. Like if I miss that time with the Lord and that time for the Holy Spirit to breathe upon his word as I read it, the time in prayer, the time in worship with God, I just, I I feel more stressed out during the day. I feel less connected. Like there's, there's just something missing in my life. And what's missing is just that moment of allowing the Holy Spirit to work in me and to fill me up in, that, in the morning. If I miss that time with Jesus, I've, I've, I've missed this opportunity to be with him to kind of renew my mind, as Paul says. We've kind of said this around here, that we pray that these corporate encounters with God would lead to daily personal encounters with God. Like we harp on this a lot because we, we believe that if, we can, if I can just get, get people to want to have this desire to have a personal encounter with Jesus on a regular basis, everything else is going to take care of itself. Y'all believe that? And so what will end up happening is we are going to see a move of God here if we can just have a personal relationship with God on a daily basis. Allow him to work on us, to fill us up. And if you're wondering, Adam, how do I have a personal encounter, encounter with God? We have a guide back there that you can grab and it can walk you through some steps, some practical steps. Now, there's not a formula for it. It's different for every person, but it's a good way of starting in this process. But we've got to continually be filled with the Spirit. Continually he's asked the Spirit, the Spirit of God, would you just fill me up? Would you continue to work on me and renew my mind and fill me up? It only happens when we're in the Word and we're in prayer. And we spend time with him in our daily encounter. When Jesus would fill the Holy Spirit, Jesus was then led by the Spirit. Number three this morning, stage three of our journey towards intimacy with the Holy Spirit, we are led by the Holy Spirit. We're led by the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was led by the Spirit in all he did, but once the Holy Spirit came upon him, look where he's led. Luke 4, 1 through 2. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil in all In those days, he ate nothing. He fasted. Now, it's interesting to me that Jesus wasn't led by the Holy Spirit into a synagogue to preach. He wasn't led to go heal someone or to perform some miracle. When the Holy Spirit came upon him, where was he led? He was led into the wilderness. And not only into the wilderness but in a place where he would deny himself of food. Here's the truth that's not very popular. The Holy Spirit will lead you to the place of self-denial before leading you to the place of promotion. The truth is, the Holy Spirit will lead you to the place of self-denial before leading you to the place of promotion. 
You see, he's more interested in relationship with you than your earthly success, my friend. He's more interested in this relationship. He's more interested in in communion with you than he is your personal success as far as earthly things are concerned. God will lead you into the desert places before he leads you to the mountaintop. So don't rebuke the times and the seasons of when you're in the wilderness. If it aligns with the word of God, it might be the Holy Spirit leading you there, and you need to be obedient to that. And here's the truth. Some of you have been stuck in the wilderness for so long because you haven't trusted the Lord in the wilderness. You've been in a desert place. You've been in the wilderness for so long because you didn't like what God told you to do. Well, Holy Spirit, I don't really like to be led into the desert, into the wilderness. I don't want to go there. How about this? How about you give me a promotion at my job? Or how about this? You just make my life full of roses and daisies and incredible and amazing. Holy Spirit, I don't like that. Give me this instead. When the Holy Spirit has asked you to tithe, but you're waiting for a surplus to give of your first fruits to the Lord. And so you're waiting for this surplus and you never do it because you aren't really trust, you don't really trust the Holy Spirit. Or he's asking you, he's saying, hey, go share your faith with that coworker, go share that, your faith with that neighbor. But you don't feel comfortable and you're afraid that they might reject you. What is the issue? It's a trust issue. You see, when you're led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit, sometimes you've got to trust him no matter what, no matter if it makes sense or not. And you're still stuck in the desert. You're still stuck in the wilderness because you haven't really trusted the Lord. How can you have friendship with someone if you don't trust them? You can't. You can't have friendship with someone that you don't trust. If I broke a promise to my wife, or if I did something to cause her no longer to trust me, we're still married, but there would have to be a mending to that relationship. Yeah? And so, I'd have to rebuild that trust. The Holy Spirit may lead you to a place of wilderness and a place where, man, it seems hard and difficult, but what he's doing is he's shaping you and molding you into the image of Christ. You see, he cares far more about your relationship than your earthly success. He wants relationship and intimacy with you. Will he trust you? Will you trust him with everything you have and everything that you are? Will you learn to trust him when it doesn't make sense? Will you learn to trust him with all that that God has given you and steward all that God has given you? Can you learn to trust him? That's where intimacy is found with the Holy Spirit and intimacy is built. Number four this morning. In in stage four of our journey towards intimacy with the Holy Spirit, we overcome through the Holy Spirit. We overcome through the Holy Spirit. Jesus had to overcome Satan in the wilderness. Luke 4, verse 3 says this, And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you, and their glory, for uh, this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Verse 7. Therefore, if you will worship before me, All will be yours. Watch how Jesus overcomes the enemy. And Jesus answered and said to him, he quotes scripture, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. 
Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. Verse 11, In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now, When the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from there until an opportune time. So Jesus felt the Holy Spirit come upon him. Then the Spirit led him to the wilderness. And there is no more mention of the Holy Spirit here in this passage. Yet, we know this, that the Holy Spirit was with Jesus. You see, when you don't feel the Holy Spirit, you have to stand on what the Holy Spirit said in his word. When you don't feel the Holy Spirit, when you don't feel like he is near, because there will be instances, there will be many times that you don't feel him, what do you have to do? You have to stand on his word. You see, the hardest times in life is when you don't feel the Holy Spirit, but you must learn to trust him at his word. And Jesus doesn't say, God, you left me. God, you deserted me. Where are you at? Jesus begins to what? He begins to quote the scriptures that the Holy Spirit wrote. You see, God's spirit will sometimes lead you to a place that only his word will get you through. God's spirit will lead you sometimes to a place where only his word will get you through. The Holy Spirit wrote the word of God, and when you cannot feel him, you can find him in the word. You can find him in scriptures. When you don't see him, don't feel him, or don't experience him, or, and you're in the wilderness, you overcome by the word. You must learn to trust him at his word. You stand on the word. You hide the word in your heart. You see, it's not about what you feel. It's about what you feed on in the wilderness season that will get you through it. You might be saying to yourself, Lord, I don't feel you right now. When you're in that wilderness season, what do you do? You've got to open the word of God. You begin to stand on the promises of God. Begin to stand on what he's spoken over you. You don't feed yourself on what the enemy is trying to tell you or uh, other things that might be coming at you. No, you believe the promises of God. It's important to feed yourself the word of God in those wilderness seasons where you don't sense him being close. Because in that moment, he's, you're, he's teaching you to trust him. Can you trust him at his word? His word is infallible. It's sharper than to any two-edged sword. Jesus defeated Satan in the wilderness with his word. We've got to know that sometimes the spirit of God will lead us into the wilderness. So we can learn to trust him. And then what do we do? We stand on the word of God. Number five this morning, last one, in stage five of our journey towards intimacy with the Holy Spirit, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Luke 4, 14, then Jesus, after this desert experience, after this wilderness experience, look what happened. Then Jesus returned in power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went throughout all the region, and he taught their synagogues, being glorified by all. So after you go through some things, you learn to trust him and the Holy Spirit helps you with using his word, then he empowers you. After Jesus came out of the wilderness, we see that Jesus was then empowered and anointed by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit rested on him. Without the Holy Spirit, you cannot fulfill your calling. Listen, Jesus' calling was what? It was to bring salvation to this world. It was to die for our sins so that we can have life in him. He couldn't have done this without the Holy Spirit. We can't do what the Holy Spirit has called us to do without the Spirit of God that lives within us and continually being filled up with the Spirit. What has God called you to do in your life? What has he called you to do in your life? Maybe he's called you every single husband in this room. He's called you to be a good husband. He's called to be, you to be a good wife. He's called you to, to, to love on your kids well. I mean, there's going to be moments where he, it's going to be hard to love on your kids well. You got to what? Have the Spirit of God to help you, right? He's called you to be a businessman and to make money for the kingdom of God. 
Listen, he does that. He's called you to, to preach the gospel, some of you. He's called you to lead worship. What has he called you to do? Listen, I recognize and I know that there is nothing that I can do apart from the Holy Spirit. There is nothing that we can do that is worth anything apart from the Holy Spirit. And sometimes it's so easy to rely on our gifts and our talents and those things that God has given us. And we, some of us revert back to that, but may we always just recognize when we shift our direction towards our own self out of our pride and lack of humility and just realize we gotta lean on the Holy Spirit. Would you rise with me in this room?